John chapter 15, verses 1 through 2 say this. I am the true vine. Of course, this is all red. This is why I love tonight. It's all red. This is all the words of Jesus. If you're new, red text means the words of Jesus in the Bible that I'm using right here. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So in a vineyard comparison, Jesus calls himself, and this is teaching obviously tonight, Jesus calls himself the vine, and the father is the vine dresser. Believers are the branches, so the father's the vine, I'm sorry, Jesus is the vine, the father's the vine dresser, believers, we are the branches, you are the branch connected to the vine, and the fruit is the character that we are called to bear, such things as Paul would say, like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And some of you listening right now are Christians, and I'm just going to be frank, you have all of, you don't have any of those. Like, you don't have any patience. There's no goodness in your heart. You have no joy. You don't have peace in your heart. You don't have love for other people. There's no gentleness. There's no self-control. So the goal is we need these things. The only way we get these things, I'm going to show you, is that Jesus cultivates these in our life as we remain in him. If you're outside of Jesus, when a believer gets outside of Christ, they lose the fruits of the Holy Spirit. They're angry, they're bitter, they're prideful, they're arrogant, they have ego, they cause dissension, they cause strife, they cause division. They're, they're always upset. These are believers outside of the vine. They, they're outside of the providence of God, of what God is saying and what God is doing. So we need to be clear here. You can be connected to the vine and bear bad fruit. We're gonna see what happens if you are. This is a very strong text and a stern warning. And I'm not gonna give you the American watered down pastor version that goes, oh, you know, God just throws you in, you know, the fire, but it's not really like hell. It's kind of just like a side area. We're going to go straight. I'm going to give it to you straight the way Jesus said it tonight. And if I'm, I know it hurts. I was convicted studying for this going, Lord, I don't want to be this person you're talking about here that gets cut off. So believers, the branches, and we need to bear the fruit. This is what we're called to do. This is what we should be showing. We should not be running around, not bearing fruit. Some history on this metaphor is this vines existed to bring forth fruit. And then the commentator, the historian says, large, sweet, juicy grapes, in order to get a crop, the vine dresser had to cut back the vines and get rid of the unproductive and dead branches. Grape vines were pruned away for the first three years to keep them from bearing fruit so that they would produce quality grapes later on. Each year after the third, they were pruned in late winter so they would yield large harvests in August and September. Gardeners pruned with a hook, a sharp curved blade is what they would use to cut off branches. They cut off all the fruitless. Are y'all hearing this? Because this will preach. They cut off all the fruitless and the dead branches so that the sap would flow to the fruit bearing branches. If a vineyard wasn't pruned, the vineyard was useless. Let me say that again. If a vineyard wasn't pruned, a vineyard would be useless. As the vine dresser, God knows what we need. He knows what we don't need. And he knows what he needs to do in our life to develop God-like character, Christ-like character. We are called to be Christ-like. He said, be holy as I am holy. So God knows what to cut off and what to prune. So in order to get the kind of fruit that God wants us to have, he needs to prune us. Some of you are being pruned right now and you think God's cutting you off, but God is pruning you. And some of you, God is cutting off and you think he's pruning you. So you need to know that there's a difference. So if you don't produce fruit, the Bible says clearly here, you will get taken away. Okay. Which we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that, but you will get taken away. If you don't produce fruit, you'll get cut off and taken away. And we're going to find out in the next few verses where God puts you. If you're not producing fruit, where God puts you. So you get cut off and taken away. So God is looking to write this down, produce something in your life. Your life is not random. Your life is not an accident. Your life is not by chance. You're not called, anointed, appointed, divinely uh, filled with the Holy Spirit to sit on a pew and do nothing for God. You're not called to sit on YouTube right here and watch me and go out and do nothing for God. You were born and called to produce godly fruit in two senses. In the first sense, kindness, joy, peace, love, patience, all the stuff we talked about. Excuse me. You should be bearing that, producing that, rather. The other senses, fruit-like, are people being discipled in your life. 
Are you out praying for the for people? Are you doing Bible studies with people? Are you helping the poor? Are you feeding those that are that are in need? Are you out witnessing, evangelizing, sharing your faith, baptizing people in water, baptizing people in the Holy Spirit? You could fill in the blank. Paul was going around baptizing people in the Holy Spirit by laying hands on them. He would go to a city called Ephesus and say, have you received the Holy Spirit? We didn't even know. This is what they said in Acts. We didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And the Bible says Paul laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now they all came to Paul and said, why aren't you water baptizing people? And Paul was like, I, I did not come or I was not called to water baptize, even though really we should all be water baptizing, but that was not Paul's specific ministry. But Paul was baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. The point is we need to be working in the field and, and actually producing something. God's invested into you. There, so, so shame on me if I'm not producing. Lord, help me to produce. There, so if I'm not producing, there's a reason why I'm not producing. There's no evidence in my life. There's no of the fruit of the spirit or the work of God. Then there's a reason why I'm not producing. And tonight I need to get to the root. No pun intended. I need to get to the root of why I'm not producing fruit. Why am I not producing fruit? Is love being produced in my life? Is peace being produced in my life? Is patience, is kindness being produced? We have so many Christians that produce absolutely nothing for God. And I don't think, it, again, it's only for the spirit, but it's also, I believe, talking about the works that God has called every single one of us to do. He's called us to work. Now, if you're producing something, so if you're not producing, you need to cry out to God tonight. Say, Lord, don't cut me off. Because if you're not, the Bible says, I don't want to twist the words of Jesus, you get cut off and thrown to the side. We're going we're gonna to show you where that ends up at the end of it all. If you are producing fruit, here's what happens. You still get pruned. There's still discipline. There's still pruning and they're still removing. Don't think just because you're getting pruned, God's disapproved of you. He might be cutting things out of your life now and I'm helping somebody so that you can produce more. So God cutting things off of us are actually a sign that we're producing something in the first place. And he wants you to produce more. So God right now for some of you, and actually for me as well, God is cutting things out of my life. God is cutting people out of my life. God is cutting friends out of my life. God might be cutting family out of your life. God might be cutting hobbies out of your life, addictions out of your life. God is pruning you. God might prune your friends. I remember when I first got saved, I was like, Lord, I've lost all my friends. The Lord's like, you didn't, oh, I'm helping somebody tonight. God's like, you didn't lose them. I'm pruning them. Isaiah, your girlfriend, she's toxic. You could, this is never going to work. I'm going to cut this relationship. God literally pruned me from a girl I was with for four years. God said, pruning that off of you, cutting her off, break up with her, Isaiah, cut it off. What about the job I'm going after? God, it's not, it's a great job, Isaiah. It's a great job, but it's not what's going to produce the most fruit in your life. So I, I got to cut it off. But Lord, I really wanted to do this. I got to cut it off. I watched as God, especially in my early days, but God is still doing this, begin to prune things out of my life. And friend, I want to tell you right now, don't be dismayed. Don't be disheartened. God is pruning you so you will produce more. God says, oh, you've been producing? And God is not punishing you. And it hurts to be pruned. Do you think the vine, do you think the branches, it feels good to have a sharp sickle knife cut something off of you come on man god is pruning you right now i'm prophesying to somebody god is pruning you let the lord prune you why are you hanging on to that girl and that guy you know they're not producing anything in your life you know that they're not they're not adding any value you know those friends you're hanging out with are leading you to worldliness let the lord cut them off i don't know why you want to hang on to something that clearly god's allowed them in your life for a year and nothing's been produced Oh man, it hurts. I really like him. I really like her. God's like, yeah, but it's either you or them. It's either I cut the branch off. Hear me tonight. I cut and prune the branches and cut away the dead areas, or I just cut you off altogether. So Lord, I'm asking you tonight to prune my branches, to cut things off my life. Don't cut me off. Cut things off my life. I'm talking to somebody and I'm, I'm going to take my time on this. Don't cut me off. Let God prune you. A trial can be God pruning you. God allowing you to go through that hard time could be the process of God pruning you. And we want to get out of the pruning process. We're like, we want more fruit. And God's like, let me cut you. And you're like, ah, I don't really want it that way. I want, I want to do less and get more, but there's, there's no way around the pruning process. It hurts. It hurts. I've been getting pruned this last few weeks. I've had friends get pruned in the last month. I've had uh, things that I love to do. God's like, nope, 
You're not doing them. I'm pruning these things off of you. And I feel this in my spirit tonight. If you don't catch anything, we're 13 minutes into the teaching. This is important. Let God prune you. And we're still on verse one, but we're going to move tonight. Let God prune you. Remember, after you make it out of the pruning, because you're like, oh, it feels so bad. After you make it out, you will produce more in Jesus' name. I know you love those branches. I know they've been there for years. I know you've known her. You've known him. You've known that. You've been in that hobby, that addiction for years, and you love it. But the Lord is saying, it's time to get cut off. It's time to get cut off. It's time to get cut off. They've been doing nothing for you. They've been bringing you down. It's time to get cut off. Pray this tonight. Lord, prune me. Pray that. I, I dare you. Don't pray it if you don't mean it. But I dare you and watch God tonight put his finger on something in your life and say, I'm cutting that off. You've been doing that. You've been that, that pornography addiction. It's time to cut it off. It's dead. It's producing nothing. You keep going right back to it. Why do you keep going back to it? It's time to cut it off. You got, you got to cut that thing off, friend. You can't allow the poison and the toxic nature of sin and lust in your heart. Lord, prune the lust off of me, Lord. I don't want to be lustful. You got to get tired of being lustful. You got to get tired of being drunk all the time. I'm always drunk. I'm always bitter. I'm always yelling at somebody. I'm always mad at somebody. Lord, cut this off of me. I need you to take this from me. So let the Holy Spirit work in you tonight. As I preach, as I teach, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to come and prune you. I really do believe that. Lord, don't cut me off. Instead of cutting me off, cut things away. And, and let me just give you this last warning because it's going to get hotter. Don't get mad when God cuts things off. Do not ask him to remove things. And then when he removes things, you get mad. It's better that he cuts things off than to cut you off. It's better that he cuts things off than to cut you off. This is real. This is real. Let's go to verse three here. Verse three through four. You already have been clean because of the word which I spoke in you. So he says, you've already been cleaned. You've been cleaned, but now I'm pruning you. Now I'm cutting things away. This is not an issue of, well, I'm clean. I don't need to be pruned. This is an issue of, you've already been cleaned, but there's a pruning process. And then this is the instruction. It sounds like, man, as you're giving me Isaiah, the first verse is a lot of bad news here. But here's the beauty. This is the, this is the command for us. Verse four, abide. I hope you guys can see my mouse. I think you can. Abide in me and I in you as the branch, this is, this is us, cannot bear fruit of itself. So without him, we can't do anything. When we move outside of his jurisdiction, we can't produce fruit unless, so it can't produce anything unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So what do we know about producing fruit? And I'm going to give you practical steps on all of this. We cannot do nothing without God. Now abide means to stay with something, to join to something, to spend time with someone or something. Apart from Christ, you can't do anything. You can't bear any fruit. You need to be joined with them. You need to spend time with them. How do we abide? Jesus, Jesus's command is abide in me. This is the command here. Abide in me. How do I, Isaiah Saldivar, in 2023, whatever date it is, abide in Christ in a practical way? Because it's it sounds good, but you can't just tell me abide in Christ. Give me some steps that I can write down that could help me to abide in Christ, stay connected, stay close. Number one, praying. Prayer is one of the most essential ways. These might sound elementary, but they're biblical. Prayer is the number one way you can abide in Christ. Number two, spending time in the Bible. You need to spend time in the word of God. I know you're lazy. I'm lazy too. I know you just want to scroll on TikTok. I know you just want to scroll on Instagram. We all do. I go through the same battles. I'm human like you, but we need to get in the word of God. Spend time in the Bible is number two. This is something I need to do more. This is something I applaud my wife for doing, which I'll talk about this next time I have her on the live stream. But my wife just finished the Bible in 99 days. This was massive. I made a post about it. She made a post about it as well. But she finished the Bible in 99 days, which is a massive accomplishment with four kids, full-time stay-at-home mom. Morning and night, she was in her Bible reading hours a day. She finished it in 99 days of the Bible front to back. This has been a huge um, struggle for her to get through the Bible since we've had kids. But she said, you know what? I'm going to abide in him. I'm going to get the Bible done. I'm going to go front to back. She, she's always struggled with the Old Testament. She went through the Old Testament. She got through all the books. She went through the New Testament. 99 days. I cannot commend her more. 99 days. She read the entire Bible with four kids and a crazy busy life. She abided in Christ and so can you. You can do it as well. So praying, spending time in the Bible. Number three, worshiping God by yourself. Worshiping God by yourself. Number four, 
fellowshipping with like-minded believers. I'm not going to go into detail on all these. I'm just going to give you practical ways on everything tonight. You guys can do this. Fellowshipping with like-minded believers. That's number four. Number five is serving people. Serving people. Serve other people. Number six is ministering, like supernatural ministry to other people. So not just serving, feeding the poor, all that, but ministering supernaturally the gifts of the Spirit to other people. And then number seven, living a consecrated life. If we do these things I'm telling you, we will, we will faithfully abide in Christ and he will abide in us. Okay, so this is the goal is we need to abide. Without him, we can't do nothing. And I want to actually show you, let me take you here to another passage here about bearing fruit. Look at what he said. Look at what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, I cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as the babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able for you're still carnal. But here's why they're carnal. Look, for there is envy, strife, divisions among you, the body of Christ here. Are you not carnal behaving like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not carnal? So there's factions. I'm of this person. I'm of this preacher. But look what he says here. This is what I want to key in on. Verse five, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but were ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one. This is what Paul says. Look, I planted, we're talking about fruit here, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So this is not about me. This is about God. So then neither the one speaking of ministers now, remember Paul and Apollos, he's talking about ministers, neither the one who plants is anything nor the one who waters, but it's God who gives the increase. So technically, it's like, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. I'm just a servant of God. And each of you will receive a reward according to his own labor. So we need to get this context here that we are planting. We are watering. We are producing something. We don't need to get in divisions and factions here. Paul says we're nothing. We're just laborers in God's harvest, in God's work. So I want now I want to show you John 15, 5. Let's go to verse 5 here. Jesus says, I am the vine, which we... We talked about this earlier, but he's going to, he's going to reiterate some of this stuff. Uh, and remember, this is the context of Jesus about to go to the cross in days. He'll be at the cross. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. So how do we bear fruit? How do we bear fruit? Look at this. God, J Jesus makes it so plain. I am him bears much. Oh, so he who abides in me. So if he abides in me, if we choose to abide in Christ, this is what happens. I in him, Jesus will abide in us. Then we will bear much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. What can Isaiah Saldivar do without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus, without God, the father, without God, what could I do? Absolutely nothing. Friend, this is what you need to realize. It's not about you, your ministry, your platform, your voice, your whatever business you have going. It literally honestly doesn't mean anything. Because here's the deal, you can't do anything without him. When we lose this, we become arrogant and proud. When we lose this, we become egotistical, we become narcissist. We need to make sure that we realize without him, we can do nothing. And then look at what Jesus says in verse six. So we know we need to abide. We need to abide. What's, what's, what happens if it, we don't? Verse six, verse six, John 15, if you're just coming on. If anyone does not abide in me, okay? So we know if we, we, know if we abide in him, what happens? But what's going to happen if we don't abide in him? If you do, so he abides. If anyone does not abide in me, doesn't have that fellowship, doesn't dwell in me, isn't close with me, isn't connected, doesn't spend time with me, this is what it says. And this is strong here. He is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. These are the words of Jesus, our Messiah, speaking out here. 2,000 years later, if you do not abide in me, you are cast out and withered. They gather, you get gathered together, you get thrown in the fire and you get burned. I know pastors preach this nice. Oh, the Lord puts you to the side. No, that's not what the Bible says. Let's be honest. The Bible says you get thrown into the fire and you're burned. What fire do we know about that Jesus constantly warns about? What fire could this possibly be? This is the fires of hell. Jesus warns about hell. There's a real place where God throws people into hell and this is what Jesus is describing here. These unfruitful Christians that say they're connected. Now, these are not worldly people. He's not talking about unbelievers here. Please, please, please hear me. He is not talking about unbelievers here. He's talking about those that are connected to the vine. The world is not connected to the vine. 
We, the Bible says, like Israel was that olive tree. We've been grafted into the vine. Even the Jews and the Gent as Gentiles, we've been grafted into the vine. So this is not unbelievers. These are those that have been in, in God. This is why this for sure disproves once saved, always saved. These people have been grafted in. They're Christian. They don't abide in Christ. They don't remain in him. The words of Jesus, they do not abide in me. And they get thrown into the fire. That's the punishment. Claim to be Christian, but you stand before God in judgment and you get thrown into hell, cut off and thrown into hell. Now, this sounds hard. You're like, man, that's so mean. Isaiah, why would you preach this to me? Would you rather hear this message on earth where you can change? Or would you rather hear this message in hell? Would you rather hear this message when it's too late? This message, if you end up in hell, God forbid, there's 2,400 of you. God forbid you end up in hell. If you do, this message will ring through your mind for all of eternity. I got thrown in the fire. I didn't abide in him. I didn't know him. I didn't have a relationship with him. We cast out demons. We did miracles. We did signs. And he says, depart from me, you who break the laws of God. I don't know you. These are real words that Jesus spoke that we can't take lightly. We can't contextualize and, you know, put our theology powder on it and say, well, you didn't really mean that, brother. We got to take the sugar off of these. And these words cut. These words are like bitter honey that we have to take in and say, no, this is real. Isaiah Saldivar. What if I'm the one? That's not abide. I, I don't read this and go, oh, it's not me. It's just them. No, I'm going, Lord, I want to make, is that me? Am I not abiding in you? I want to make sure, Lord, I abide in you. I don't want to be arrogant and proud and act like they, they, it's all them. And I don't have any, you know, I'm abiding all. No, I, no, I want to make sure I abide. I'm reading this. I'm, I'm struck by this. I have the fear of the Lord. So trust me, friend. This is not just you. That's like, whoa, this is strong. I think it's strong as well. But here's the beauty. Now, I want, I want to say this as well. As a gardener removes dead, non-producing branches and throws them in the fire, so God removes dead, non-producing Christians for their la because of their lack of relationship and throws them into hell. I don't know where we got off preaching hell is not real. Hell is real. It's real. John 15, 7. But, but don't worry, it doesn't end there. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. Excuse me and it shall be done for you. But this is my father, but, but this my father is glorified by this, excuse me, that you bear much fruit so you'll be my disciples. How is the father glorified? And I, I'm being very simple tonight. How is the father glorified by this? By what? You abiding in me and my words abiding in you. This is what I want you to look at. My words abiding in you. That's the important thing you have to understand. True followers of Jesus allow his words to actually change their life. This is what it's about. His words being life changing. I take them serious. Friend, do you take the Bible serious? Do you take these words in red serious? Are you living your life going, I have to obey the scripture. Friend, when things come up in my life, I go to the word of God and I go, I have to obey this. I don't care what people are saying on social media. I don't care what people think about me in comment sections. I don't care what my wife says or my kids or my pastor or anybody up, uh, out, if they violate the word of God, this is my ultimate authority. No matter what anyone else says, if it violates the word of God, I go to God. I take the word of God serious. This is what matters, the word of God, because I want his words to abide in me. I want to take the word of God serious. And some of you have been lax. Some of you have been playing games with God. You've been taking the word of God as a joke. You haven't obeyed him. You haven't obeyed him when he said, don't get involved in witchcraft. You haven't obeyed him when he said, if your eye caused you to sin, gouge it out. You haven't obeyed him when he says, if you even lust at a woman, if you even look at her with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You don't obey him. We've been given commandments I'm about to go over. Take the Bible serious. His words are, are not a suggestion. They're a command. The Bible's not God's opinion. The Bible is God's word. My words abide in you. Let the words abide in you. Let the scripture govern your life. Why is the scripture in the back seat? Why do you drive and crash and then pull out the scripture like it's your Geico car insurance policy? Let the, the scripture guide you. Let the scripture dictate your decisions. Before you lash out, before you're bitter, before you're resentful, before you're angry, before you're divisive, before you strive, have pride and arrogance, look to the word of God, friend. Let the word of God. Some, are saying, some people are typing in the chat, forgive me, Lord. Yeah, yeah, you can say that tonight. While you have time, you can say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. Let his words abide in you. I know there's new believers in the chat. Let his words abide in you. So if you abide in him and his words abide in you, you will pray the right things and those prayers will be answered 
and the answered prayer, God the Father is glorified and you'll bear much fruit. That's the order. You abide in him. He abides in you. His words abide in you. You ask for whatever you desire, what you desire. It will be done for you. And by what he does for you, the answered prayer, and by abiding in the Father and the, or in Jesus and his words in you, my Father is glorified. And you'll bear much fruit. I want to bear fruit. So do I. So I'm going to abide in Christ. I'm going to let his words abide in me. So you will be my disciples. So you'll be my disciples. Get to know his word. If you don't know the Bible, start learning it. If you don't understand it, start reading it. Start getting someone to disciple you. Find somebody. Verse 9, look at this. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. And then look at verse 10, and this is going to get interesting. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So how do I, now you're, now you're telling me to abide in your love? But Jesus, how do I abide in your love? This is the key. If you keep my commandments. If. That means you might not. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as, as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be made full. So this is the goal here, keeping his commandments. Now, most people in the chat, most Christians don't even know that Jesus gave us commandments. Like, what do you mean? You're talking about the Ten Commandments? Now, Jesus did reiterate nine of the Ten Commandments, so we should keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, the only one he didn't reiterate, which I'm not going to get into a big debate on. This is just a fact. Okay, I'm not saying don't keep the Sabbath, but the only one he didn't reiterate on was the keeping of the Sabbath, of the Ten Commandments. Just That's just a fact. And it's not a teaching where he's, that's not me saying you don't need to keep the Sabbath or you shouldn't. I'm just telling you the facts are nine of the Ten, he re-spoke. So we should be keeping, of course, the Ten Commandments. They're God's laws. But he says, if you keep my commandments, what were Jesus' commandments? Are you ready? Because we're going to go over them. Jesus says, if you want to experience my love and abide in me, this is how you abide in me. So I need to know all about them. When he, when he says, don't lust, you need to obey that command. That's a commandment. So I don't look upon women with lust because he commanded me not to. If you don't keep his commandments, you will not experience his love. You will not abide in him and you will be cut off. So here we go. We're going to give a bunch of his commandments, probably like 20, just quickly. And then I'm going to give you the verse reference and you can rewind the video. This will be on YouTube forever. So you can go back. Don't be like, you're going too fast, brother. Just let me go because I have a lot to cover. I'm already 30 minutes in and we're not even halfway down chapter one and we have two chapters to go over. So let me just go for those and I'll give you the reference. You can come back to them later. You can speed write them down, but just let me go here. Before you pray, forgive anyone that you have anything against. Oh, that's a commandment. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, before you pray, do you have anything against anyone? Go forgive them. That's a commandment. You must be born again. John chapter three, verse seven. That's a commandment. Remain in Christ. John 15, four. We just talked about that. That's a commandment. Remain in me. When Jesus says do something, he's commanding you to do something. Let your light shine before men. Matthew five fourteen. That's a commandment. He didn't say, if you feel like it, let your light, don't hide your light. Don't hide the gospel. Don't hide your faith. Matthew 5, 14, let your light shine before men. I'm giving you commandments here. These are commandments Jesus gave us. Settle matters quick with people that you have adver adversaries. Those that you de have dealings with, settle the matter. Don't go on a years and years with issues and drama between people. That's Matthew 5, 25. Anything that causes you to sin, get rid of it. That's Matthew 5, 29. Get rid of what caused you to sin. These are commandments that Jesus gave. Are you guys catching? These are commandments. These are not options. Do not swear. Matthew 5, 34. And you shouldn't swear like cuss words, but that's not what he's talking about. Swearing is making oaths. I swear I'll do this. I swear I'll go there. I swear. He goes, don't swear. Yeah, you're yes to be yes. Why do you need to swear? Why do you need to make promises? Are you a person that's flaky? Are you always not doing what you say you're going to do? So now every time you say to me, I swear because you didn't do it last time. The point is this. Be a consistent person. If you say you're going to get something done, get it done. If you say, I'm going to show up for you at seven, show up at seven. You don't need to swear to anybody. I swear I'll go. Don't, don't swear. Just be a reliable person. I, I don't ever feel the need in my life to ever swear and say, honey, I swear I'll get it done. That's childish. I don't need to swear. I get what done what I say. If I don't, if I'm not going to get it done, I'm not going to say it. If I'm going to be a frosted flake, then I'm not going to say I'm going to do it. So don't swear. Matthew 5, 34. If somebody hits you or mistreats you, turn the other cheek. That's a commandment. Matthew 5, 38. Oh, I'm going to get him back. No, you're not. No, you're not. Jesus says, no, what you're going to do is when they slap you, you're going to turn the other cheek. You're going to bless them. Bless your enemies, the Bible says. These are all commandments. I'm, I'm, I got a lot more here. Matthew 5, 40. 
Give more than is asked of you. Give more than is asked of you. If somebody asks you to do something, do more. If they say, I need 30, give them 60. If they say, I need 20, give them 40. If they say, will you mop this area, mop the whole area. If you're at work and your boss says, can you clean up four of those chairs over there and your other employee will clean up four, clean up eight of them. That's a commandment, dude. What? What? I'm supposed to do more? I'm supposed to do more than I'm asked to do? This is the kingdom way, friend, Matthew 540. Matthew 5.43, oh, this one's hard. This one's hard, are you guys ready? Love your enemies. Oh, why'd you have to say that, Jesus? I have to keep these? I have to do all these things? And if I don't do these things, I break your commandments and it means I don't love you? I gotta love my enemies, those people that hate me. Not my friends, not my family, my enemies. The people like, oh, I can't stand that guy. He made me lose my job. He made a video about me, he's this. He hates me. He robbed me. He stole from me. Man, they took... God says, love them. He got custody of my kids. God says, love them. He wrecked my car. God says, love them. He stole from me. $20,000, my life savings out of my bank account, stole from me. God goes, you know what you, you, know you got to do? You got to love them. I'm getting convicted, y'all. Oh, type one if you're getting convicted. These are commandments here. I'm give, I've given you like 10 or 15 already. Matthew 6, 1. Give to please God, not to be seen by man. When you're giving your finances, when you're giving things away, when you're blessing people, give to please God, not to be seen by man. Matthew 6, 5, pray privately. Go in your prayer closet. This is a commandment. Pray in private. Cry out to God in private. You don't have to do everything in public. You don't have to do everything at church. To show everyone you're spiritual. Pray privately. Matthew 6, 16, fast. Oh no, I have to. Yes. You got to do it. You got to fast. You got to fast. You have to do it. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up earthly treasures, but instead store up treasures in heaven. Oh man, the world keeps telling me all of these hurt. All of these hurt. I feel it in my stomach. The world keeps telling me get a savings. Get a large savings. Store up wealth. Create wealth. Come on. Dave Ramsey keeps telling me to save. Eat beans. Sell it all drive a cheap car and save and save and save. And the Lord says, ah, don't stir up earthly treasures, but store up treasures in heaven. Like friend, I know you have so much in your stock account, but do you have heavenly treasures? We spend 60 years working at a job, working to store up a 401k, to store up a retirement, but our, our heavenly bank account is empty. It's literally empty. And the Bible says, stop, Stop storing up for things that the moth can eat and you're going to die and it's going to be gone. Store up heavenly treasures. So, ugh. Now I know you're like, well, the context, I'm just telling you what he said. I'm just telling you what he said. Matthew 6, 25. Oh, this one's convicting. Oh, this one, this one hits you. Do not worry about your needs. Do not worry about clothing. Do not worry about, oh, I have to get food. We're not going to have enough from God. Don't even worry. Instead, pray about everything. Do not worry about your needs. Matthew 6, 25. This is one of my favorites. Oh, I love this one. If you've ever battled anxiety or you're an anxious person, you're about to love Matthew 6, 34. These are all commandments. I should make this a separate YouTube video. Matthew 6, 34. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry about tomorrow. For today has enough troubles in itself. That's a command. That's not he's saying, if you don't feel like worrying about it, don't. He said, do not, that's a command, worry about tomorrow. This has changed my life. I don't look at six months from now, four months from now, plan out my next you know, seven weeks every single day, stress out. What am I doing tomorrow? What do I need to get done? Oh, I have a podcast tomorrow with Z. All right, we're gonna get it done. Tomorrow, I'll worry about it. I'm not worrying about it. I'm not worrying about it. We're gonna worry about today. Tomorrow has enough worries. Okay, Matthew. Whoo, it's getting hot in here. Let me turn my AC on. Matthew 6, Look at this. Place God first. Another commandment. Place God first. Have you placed God first in your life? If not, you're breaking his commandments. These are all commandments Jesus gave. Well, we don't have to follow the commandments. What are you even talking about? Yes, we do. Matthew 7, 7. He commands us to ask, seek, and knock. Matthew 25, 34. Care for those in need. Not asking you. I'm telling you, if there's someone in need, care for them. Matthew 10. Heal the sick. Drive out demons. Supernatural ministry. He commanded the disciples. It's not a, he, didn't, he didn't ask them. This was a commandment. Matthew 18. Settle disputes between other believers in a godly manner. Settle disputes in a godly manner. John 15, love one another. Are you guys doing these things? 
Luke 22, 19, do communion. Remember the Lord's Supper, do communion. That's a commandment. Luke 6, 36, be merciful. Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples and baptize them. It's not an option. It's not an option, it's a commandment. And again, I have highlighted on screen, if you keep my commandments, these are all commandments. Luke 12, 40, be ready for the Lord's return. I just gave you two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, like what 30 commandments jesus gave us and jesus says if you keep i know it was a long intersection we needed to go on that journey because you guys have a long road ahead if you keep my commandments you abide in you will abide in my love how do i abide in your love if you you keep you you keep the commandments this is what he says to do now look at what verse 12 says this is my commandment now he's giving us a commandment right here keep my commandments plural so that means all the stuff he said before this but now he has, this is my commandment. Here's one, that you love one another as I have loved you. How intense was the love that Jesus had for his disciples? How intense was that love? Love one another like that. Do we display that as Christians? Of course we don't. We're all too busy, just whatever it is, bickering and arguing about tongues and spiritual gifts and deliverance and miracles and salvation and once saved always saved and is it for today is it for yesterday and cessationism and uh self all we're arguing we're bitter we're all just eh, back bickering back and forth and he says mm, i want you to love each other the way i loved you and then he says in verse 13 look at this greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends this would be the ultimate display of love if Jesus can sacrifice his life for us, we can sap sacrifice some time to help other believers. The ultimate sign of love was Jesus was going to lay down his life in a few days for the disciples. And then look at verse 14. I want, you to, I want you to note this. Verse 14, let's move here. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Whoa. There's conditions? I'm not automatically a friend of God? In Bible school, and at my Bible su Sunday school, I got taught that we're all friends of God when we sang that song. Nope. You are my friends if, if, you don't just get to be my friend, sorry, if you do, you do whatever I command you. So all these commandments I've been reading off and someone said there's over 50 commandments in Matthew. Yeah, that makes you eligible to be a friend of God. You cannot be this rebellious Christian out here. If, not everyone's eligible. Now, when you're God's friend, what does he do? I'm going to show you. Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants. This is, the, this is the thing about a servant. For a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you my friends. For all things that I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. A servant doesn't know what God is up to. A servant doesn't know what God is doing. A friend does. That's the difference between Christians that are servants and Christians that are friends. Friends know what God is up to. Friends know what God is doing. This is a... And back then, friendship was much more powerful than it is today. It meant loyalty. It meant sharing possessions. It meant intimacy of sharing secrets. It means to be a friend in the court in the Greek. Someone who's part of the king's inner circle in the Greek. That's the friend. That's the friend. It's not just, oh, we're friends, we hang out and get ice cream. It's, there's, a, there's a deep meaning to it. Verse 16. Oh, I love this. This is so good. You did not choose me. Very important. You did not choose me. I'm going to tell you why this is important. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Don't just get fruit, fruit that remains. Whatever you ask the Father, and this is something I'm going to be honest, I have no clue what this means. And I'm going to tell you all about that in a minute. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. So we know we're supposed to love one another. This is the key. You did not choose me. I chose you. Why does it matter? Why does it matter if you, if you think, you know, type in the chat, why does it matter that God chose me and I didn't choose him? Because if I chose God, I can be proud and say, I'm the one that chose you. But because I didn't choose him, God came to me and chose me when I was cussing at him at an altar as an atheist saying, I don't believe in you, but if you're real, I'll give you my life. When I was cursing him out, he chose me. It was nothing that I say a Saldivar did, friend. It was nothing that I was a part of. He chose me. So you didn't choose him, he chose you. So how could I be arrogant and proud? Oh, it's my platform, I'm a great preacher. What does that even mean? I didn't even choose this life. I didn't choose this life, this life chose me. That's the thing. I can't be proudful and arrogant. You know like the worst feeling ever? I'm getting, you know, flashbacks. Is getting picked last in gym class during a lineup. 
We used to always play dodgeball at church and they're like, all right, everyone line up. Why do we do this to kids? Now everyone's like, you know, everyone's too soft in the schools now and, and young people don't even do this. I don't think they even do this anymore. You know, we're, we're all too soft to do this, but it was the worst feeling when you line up and everyone's like, I'll take Sally. I'll take Brittany. I'm like, dude, it's not, it's all girls and then me and you're picking all the girls. I'll take, and you're just sitting there and you're like, and you're the last pick. You're the default pick. Everyone's gone. You're like, I guess I'll have Isaiah because he's the last one there. I'm like, dude, what? You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? That is not what God did. God lined up every Pharisee, every Sadducee, and I'm being facetious. I'm being, I'm being metaphorical before you clip this because everything I say gets clipped and gets made into a video for the heresy hunters. But, so let me just say I'm being figurative here. Being figurative. This is not in the Bible. God lines up all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees, all anyone. He could have picked anybody. And he goes, Matthew, I pick you. John, I pick you. Peter, I pick you. Friend, you were God's first pick. You were God's first pick. You weren't a trade. You weren't like third pick. You weren't, you were God's first pick. You did not choose him. He chose you. Why try to be like everyone else when you're chosen? Why try to fit in if God chose you? Why try and copy and paste someone else's ministry when God chose you? Why try to be like Isaiah? Do you know in my early days, I was like, I want to try to be like so-and-so and so-and-so. And I'm like, why? I want to be, I want to be me. I still, I still at times catch myself going like, I wish I was more like this person because they speak better. They're more intellectual. They use bigger words and, and my flesh, my sin nature goes, oh, I wish I was more like them. I wish I didn't talk the way I talked. I wish I didn't talk so fast and so loud and so wild. And I pick apart the way I present the gospel and things. And I go, oh, I don't know. The God's like, what are you talking about, Isaiah? You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I called you to talk the way you talk. I called you to preach the way you preach. I called you to bring up the scripture that you bring up the scripture. Stop trying to be like everyone else and be like who God's called you to be. Why? Why be like everyone else when you're original? Why try to fit in if God chose you? Why try and copy? Why try to be an echo when you've been called to be a voice? I don't get it. Does anyone remember when he chose you? Does anyone have a flashback in the chat? 2,500 of you in the chat. Does anyone have a flashback? of the night God chose you, you know, when I'm going through turmoil or trial and I'm like, oh, I don't know the online stuff, the this, there's a lot of pressure in my life and reading comments and seeing videos like, oh, do I want to do this? I'm tired. It's like, do I really even want to do this? Why don't I just go and shut all my stuff down and just be a part of my church and just live a quiet life? I just want to be home. I don't even like traveling. I don't like large crowds. I don't like tons of followers. I don't like all of it. I don't like the views. I don't like checking my videos all the time. It's like, uh, I don't really like it. But then it's like, hold on, hold on. I remember when he chose me. I remember January 12th, 2011, God called my name, 7 billion people. And God audibly called my name, called me into the ministry, gave me a vision that night, 12 years ago of me standing on a stage, preaching to thousands of people, untold pe amounts of people. And God said, I'm going to use you to reach the nations. And now I'm standing here doing it and I'm complaining. And I'm whining about someone said this or someone said that. Friend, you got to go back. Those of you discouraged right now, let me go off here and just say this. Remember that he chose you. Remember when he chose you. Remember why you do what, why you doing what you're doing. Don't get lost in the sauce. Don't get caught up in the social media, this or drama or this or that or whatever it is in life. You're just tired. God called you. God chose you. Just understand that and keep running the race. Remember why you started. I was unworthy. I said, God, I don't have nothing to offer you because I don't need anything. I just need your hands. I need your feet. I need your obedience. That's literally all God needs is your obedience. He's not looking for your abilities. He's looking for your availability. God's chosen you for such a time as this. And then he says, whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. Now, I don't know what he's talking about there. I don't fully understand what this means. And I don't want to, what, what I would do is like, what I would want to do is just say, oh, well, he didn't mean, you know, a lot of guys teach the Bible and they go, well, he meant in the context, I'm not going to do that because I literally don't know what he means. Look at what he says here. Whatever you ask, that word is whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. So I don't know. We have this, we have this ability to come before the father in the name of Jesus and ask for things and it'll be given. Why are we trying to water these verses down and understand them and go, oh, well, he didn't really mean anything. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. He said it. He didn't mean whatever. I mean, he said whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. So I would try to water this down and say, well, only if, but he, but he said it. So I'm just going to leave it. I'm not even going to touch it. I'm just going to leave it because he said it. 
And I'm not going to try to put in my carnal logic of what he meant because it sounds like he meant what he meant. These things I command you that you love one another. We got to go quick here. The next chapter is not going to take long. Look at this. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would, lo the world would love its own. Yet, because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to me, do to you for my name's sake, because they don't know the one who sent me. Wow. If the world hates you, it, it hated me first. So if the world hates you, it's because you've come out of the world. If the world loves you, <laughs> let me say that again. If the world loves you, pastor, it's because you're still in the world. We have all these pastors putting on these grand performances, trying to look like the world, trying to act like the world. Dr I, I just got to say it. Some of these pastors out here flexing on their expensive clothing, getting out of their supercars and their expensive clothing. I scroll. I'm like, is that a, I thought that was a rapper. No, no shot. No chance. That's a pastor all Gucci'd out with the, you know, $5,000 outfit. There's no way getting out of their, their sports cars. No way flexing. Now, if you're going to have that, have it, but don't flex on me. Don't be on the internet flexing on everybody. The lady in the front row that can't even pay her mortgage, can't even pay her light bill. And you just flex, got, get out of your Lamborghini with all Gucci'd out $30,000 worth of clothing. And you post on Instagram. I'm like, no way. And the world loves you. And, and the, oh, we're going there. Go look at the comments of these pastors, all celebrities, all celebrities. And I'm like, oh, these must be Christians. You click on their page, all worldly, all carnal. The world loves them. The world loves them. Uh, if, if a bunch of celebrities start hitting me up and really liking me and they don't want to change their lifestyle, I'm going to get kind of scared. I'm going to get kind of scared if the celebrities start loving me. Now, there's a bunch of celebrities that have reached out to me because they've watched my videos and they've gotten delivered and demons cast out of them. They want to serve the Lord and I minister to them. And I don't mention their names, but I've ministered to many high profile celebrities through what God's used my internet uh, ministry to do. Some I'm talking to right now that I'm discipling that every one of you would know that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't call them out someday, maybe. But just understand, like friend, oh man. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. So you got to you got to remember. You got to remember that if the world loves you, it's probably because you're of the world. If the world likes you, it's probably because you're walking with them. But if it hates you, it might be because now if the world hates you because you're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing, that doesn't count. If you're stirring things up and you're, you know, think you're the guy that's supposed to call every single thing this and everything that and you're just stirring up trouble in the world and people hate you because you're you're a troublemaker, don't say, "Well, I hated Christ too." No, that's, that's not the way this works. They were faithfully following Jesus and they, and they were hated because they were followers of Jesus. Not when we're out here purposely doing things that are anti-God, anti-biblical, and then saying, we don't know why the world hates us. I'm like, well, I know why. Because of the way you're acting. That's not, that's not the way. Remember, Jesus said the world hates me, excuse me, because I testify that its works are evil. Look at verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater. Okay, I read that 21. All these things will do for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. And then look at verse. So, so we know that Jesus says all these things are going to do to you um, and they're going to persecute you the way they persecuted me. They're also going to persecute you. This is what he said. Now, this was written. Think about this. John's writing this after this prophecy has been fulfilled. Let me go over quickly here because it's, it's important. What happened to all the disciples? History tells us. Peter and Paul. This is uh, Christianity.com where I'm getting the info. Wow, we just had 3,200 viewers. I don't know what happened. We just jumped like 500 people. Peter and Paul both were martyred in Rome, 66 AD, during the persecution under the Emperor, uh, Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his request because he did not feel worthy to die the same way the Lord died. So they crucified Peter upside down and they beheaded Paul. Andrew went to the land of man-eaters in what is now the Soviet Union. Christians there claim that he was the first one to bring the gospel to the land. He preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and Greece, where he said to have been crucified. So Paul, Peter gets crucified upside down. Andrew gets crucified. These are the people Jesus is talking to in this text. This is what happened to them. History tells us. Thomas, 
was probably the most active in the area of Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far as East India, where the ancient Marthoma Christians revere him as their founder. They claim that he died where they then pierced Pier, and he, they claim that he died there when they pierced through the spears of four soldiers. So four soldiers basically impaled Thomas. Philip, it says Philip possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa and Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. He converted this proconsul's wife and there, he was cruelly, basically tortured and put to death. Matthew who was the tax collector and the writer of the gospel, ministered in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports say that he was martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in e Ethiopia. Bartholomew had a widespread missionary, traveled all around. Um, tradition has him going to India with Thomas and going back to Armenia, Ethiopia, and Southern Arabia. There are various accounts of how he died as a martyr for the gospel. So we're, they're not decided, but we know he was martyred for the gospel. James was the son of Alphaeus, is one of the la uh, least three James referred to in the New Testament. There's some confusion as to which is which, but James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish, the Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. These are horrific, horrific ways to die. And Jesus said, this is what's going to happen to you. Don't be surprised. Simon the Zealot, as story goes, ministered in Persia, and he was killed because he refused a sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias who was the apostle chosen to replace Judas, tradition, tradition tells us he went to Syria and Andrew and him were put to death by burning. John, the only one of the apostles thought to have died a natural death of old age. He was a church leader in Ephesus and was said to have taken care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home. During Demetian, Demetian, Demetian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. There he was credited with writing, the last book of the new the last book of the new testament revelation and early latin tradition has him escape and unhurt after they cast him into boiling oil in rome all these disciples except for john died horrific deaths were beat for the gospel were tortured were hung upside down were pierced went through things that were absolutely horrific and me and you were able to he come here and tonight i'm able to preach to now 3300 of you in the broadcast freely because what these men were willing to do this is no game. This is no jo joke. Persecution is very real and persecution is still happening right now as I speak. As I'm preaching this, somebody's being persecuted for the gospel. As I'm, as I'm preaching this, somebody is being tortured for the gospel. Look what he says here. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. Okay. Uh, we're at verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates, he who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done, um, not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled in the law. They hated him without cause. So even though Jesus did all these things, they hated Jesus without cause. That's the bottom line. Jesus came to them and he showed them miraculous signs and wonders and they hated him without a cause. Killed him without a cause. Type one if you want me to go in uh, to chapter 16 here. The coming rejection. Oh, you know what? We didn't do, I'm sorry. We didn't do verse 26 here. Let's go to verse 26 really quick here. I apologize. We skipped forward. Verse 26 here. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. And you, will, and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit, the helper went over last week is going to be sent from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? He proceeds from the Father. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? Testify of Jesus. And he's still doing that to this day. And, he will all, and you will also bear witness. So the, the Holy Spirit's going to bear witness and witness of Jesus. And you will also. Ver, now let's go into chapter 16. This is all just continued here. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think they offer God a service. And these things they will do to you because they've not known the Father nor me. So they're going to kill you. Jesus, think about this, is preparing his disciples to be killed. They're going to be killed, and the people that are killing them think they're doing God a favor. And by the time John wrote this book, everything Jesus said had already come to pass, and many of the disciples, as I just said, had already been martyred. And believers right now are still being persecuted around the world. Roughly 1.1 million Christians were martyred, 1.1 million worldwide between 2000 and 2010. 
In the 21st century, between 100 and 160,000 Christians are killed every single year. More than 70 million Christians have been reported to be martyred throughout the course of history. 70 million Christians have been martyred since the course of history. More than half were, ma were martyred in the 20th century under communist and fascist governments. 322 Christians are killed every month for their faith. 215 churches are destroyed every single month because of their faith. 770 forms of violence, beatings, kidnapping, kidnaps, uh, rapes, arrests are committed against Christians every single month. This is a real thing. If you're not being persecuted, if you're not being you know, killed for the gospel, tortured for the gospel, praise the Lord that I'm able to be here live in my air-conditioned studio preaching the gospel for that I will never take for granted. And I thank God for that that privilege I have, the freedom I have. This is real, friend. This is really happening right now as I speak. Verse four through six. But these things I've told you. So why are you telling these things? And this chapter won't take long. These things I've told you that when the time comes for what? For them to throw you out of their synagogues and kill you thinking they're doing God a favor, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things do not say at the beginning because I was with you. And these things I did not say at the beginning because I was with you. So now why are you saying them? Because he's leaving is why he's saying them now. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you, and none of you asks, where are you going? But because I've said things to you, these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now you're probably like, well, the disciples are confused. Jesus just said, remain in me. And now he says, I'm leaving you. You can't be with me. They are confused because they don't fully understand yet the coming of the Holy Spirit and, the, and Jesus, the Holy Spirit speaking on behalf of Jesus filling people and now Christ in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. God, the father on the throne, Jesus at the right hand of the father in heaven right now. And the Holy Spirit in us, God in us through the person of the Holy Spirit, who is God and who is a person be clear on that. So yes, Jesus is preparing them for a hard season. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Look at this. Whoa. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, what's going to happen if he doesn't go away? The helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. So it's advantageous. It means it's good. It's not like good, like I'm happy to leave or you're happy I'm gone. The Greek is like, it's profitable. It's beneficial if I go. It's to your benefit. It'll be, it'll be better, more productive. There's one of me now. But when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And now millions upon millions of people throughout history will have the Holy Spirit and Christ will be living in us through the Holy Spirit. So it's a, be it's a beautiful thing, verse 8. And when he's come, he'll convict the world of sin. What is he going to do when he comes? Step one, first order of business, convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So three areas of conviction. One, he convicts of sin, which sin is, if you don't know, breaking the laws of God, missing the mark. Those that break the laws of God are sinning, the Bible says. That is sin. But also, he's going to convict of righteousness. That's right standing with God. And then also, he's going to convict in regards to judgment. I remember the night I got saved, I was a very had a very unclean mouth before I was saved. Every other word was pretty much a cuss word. I had a very foul mouth. And the moment I encountered the Holy Spirit, I was instantly, I went from having no guilt and shame of my sin, instantly convicted of my sin, instantly convicted of my sin. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're not convicted of your sin, you need the Holy Spirit. You do need the Holy Spirit tonight. We'll pray for that tonight. Verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And these are, he's already said so many strong, heavy things. He goes, I want to say more, but I'm going to have to wait. You, you guys can't handle this. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he'll tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit, man, we're learning so much. I have a whole video, an hour and a half on the Holy Spirit. I'll um, search the channel, search Isaiah, the Holy Spirit, and you'll find a, a whole hour and a half live stream on all the things the Holy Spirit does. But he's going to speak for Jesus. So he will hear, he'll speak for him. He'll glorify Jesus. He'll take what is Christ's and declare it to us. So the Holy Spirit has many, many things that he does. Verse 15, all these things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So this all belongs, he says, all the things the Father has, Jesus says, belong to me and the Holy Spirit's going to give them to you. He's going to declare them to you. And then I love this, and he's going to guide you into truth. Glorify me and guide you into truth. Verse 16. A little while you will not see me again, and a little while you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, 
What is this that he says to us? A little while and you're not going to see me? Again, a little while you will see me? And because I go to the Father, they're very confused on the language. What is he talking about? They said, therefore, what is this he says? A little while. We do not know what he's saying. So they're still clueless about him dying and he's going to be resurrecting here. Let's go look at, look at here, verse 19. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him and he said to them, so he knew their thoughts and what they wanted to ask. Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while and you'll not see me. And again, a little while you'll see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. So you're going to be weeping and lamenting. The world who's crucifying me is going to celebrate my death, which is so demonic. They're going to rejoice. Yes, the rebel, the claimed to be God, Messiah is dead. They're going to rejoice. You'll be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, look what he says here. When she's in labor, has sorrow because her, hour, her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that, human be, for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. So if you think about this, and I, I have four kids, so I've seen this a bunch of times with my wife having our four kids. When a woman is giving birth and screaming and crying and it's the most unbearable, agonizing pain, that you could possibly imagine they go from screaming crying and in sorrow okay just think context of the disciples he's relating childbirth to what the disciples are about to go through are y'all catching this so you're cr- oh it hurts it hurts the girl the girl screaming the woman's screaming then the baby comes out and the baby cries and the mom starts crying and the mom instantly doesn't care about the pain any longer like man you've been screaming for hours And the moment the baby comes out and they put the baby on your chest, instantly, you're not worried about the pain. You don't remember the pain. You could care less. You don't think about it. How is it possible? Come on, ladies. Somebody help me up in the chat here. I got four kids. How could you have the worst pregnancy ever? Nine months of being motion sick. Are there any ladies in the chat? Can I hear somebody say something? Nine months of being motion sick. Nine months of of eight months to nine months of just throwing up. Miserable. You had a miserable pregnancy. Let's just, just... Just say, just follow me. You have the baby. You go through eight hours of labor, hardest labor. The baby comes out. You bring the baby home. And within just a few months, you're pregnant again. Come on. Do I have any Hispanics in the chat? Help me here. You're like, I'm never having another kid. It was too painful. It was too hard. My, my everything, not eight, eight, nine months. I carried the baby and this and that. It was so, and then boom, you have another kid and then another kid and then another kid. How is it? This is exactly what Jesus is relating it to. In the same way the woman has pain and sorrow, when the baby comes, joy, joy, and she totally forgets about, she totally forgets about all the pain that she went through. The disciples would weep and mourn. Friend, right now, some of you are going through something and it's hard, but God is producing something and there will be joy after. There will be joy after. And this was the disciples. There would be joy after. When he resurrected, he goes, there's sorrow now, just like a woman in labor, but there's joy. Therefore, look at, therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will, t- no one will take from you. That's the joy, friend, of answered prayer. That's the joy of being a Christian. No one can take this. It's like, man, you, you go through all the trial of praying for somebody and laboring for your family or friend. They get saved and all the trial, all the trouble you went through praying for them is all worth it and then he relates to this look and then he ties it into prayer look and in that day you'll ask me nothing verse 23 most of i say whatever you ask the father in my name he'll give you until now you've asked for nothing in my name ask and you will receive that your joy may be may be made full what he's saying is if you start praying and asking for things and i answer the things you ask for Your joy is going to come because you see me answer prayers. Some of you have no joy because you're not praying and God can't answer prayers. You didn't even pray. I'm preaching strong tonight. You have no joy because you're not asking things in prayer. So God's not answering prayer. So there's no joy. But if you would start asking him for things in prayer, he would start doing those things and the answered prayer would bring you joy. There is no joy like someone you've been praying for for years getting saved. Come on, chat. Where are you at tonight? There is no joy like seeing somebody's sick in body get healed. There is no joy for someone that's demonized getting delivered. You're like, you're so full of joy because you asked the father to deliver them. 
You ask God to heal them. God does it. Now, some of you are depressed and have no joy because you don't pray for anything. You don't, you literally don't pray. So stop waiting for God to answer prayers. You haven't prayed. He says until now, you haven't even asked for anything. I'm like, what are you even doing out here? Some of you, like, when's the last time you even asked? I want God to save my dad. Why haven't you asked him? Huh? Why haven't you asked him? Do you spend time praying for your dad every day? Are you calling out to God? Come on now. You need to start praying. Verse 25. He says, these things I've spoken to you in a figurative language. But the time is coming when I'll no longer speak to you in a figurative language. But I'll tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. And I do not say that I... And I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. So Jesus goes, there's coming a time where I'm not going to pray to the Father for you because, look at this, the Father himself loves you. I think sometimes we forget God the Father and we're like, we know Jesus loves us, but, but Jesus is like, yeah, but the, God the Father also loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said, see, now you're speaking plainly. This is what they said. See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we get it. Now we're sure you know all things and we have no need of any question. Uh, anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Come on, boys. John 16, it took you all these time. How many years? You finally... Oh, no, don't be like the disciples, y'all, in this area. Don't let it take you 16 chapters to go, I finally know you came from God. All the miracles, all the signs, all the wonders, all that Christ has done for you, chat, and you're finally waking up to him. You're finally going, oh, man, God, now I believe in you. What are you, just now? Just now you started believing after all that God has done just now? People come to my services are like, man, your sermon, finally, I believe God. I'm like, that's what it took? A sermon after all the years of God sparing you? Like, I should have known at 12 years old when God pulled me off that rope, when I accidentally hung myself and an angel came, the angel of the Lord came and pulled me off the rope and saved my life. I should have known then. Why did it take years of parting and being rebellious and claiming to be an atheist, which was so dumb? Why did it take that for me? It's like, man, it took me 16 chapters to get here. He's, they, they go by this. What was it? It was just him speaking plainly. By this, we believe you came forth from God. And Jesus said, do you now believe? Come on, y'all. Now you believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you'll be scattered, each to his own, and leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. He's talking about getting arrested. He's about to get arrested. And they're all going to scatter. They're all going to scatter. He's going to be by himself, but he's not going to be by himself because the Father is with him. These things I've spoken to you that in me, you may have peace in the world. That you may have peace in the world. Not maybe, not if, not but. You will have tribulation. Sorry. Sorry. I know all the, I know all the word of faith prosperity preachers told you something else. Ugh. Feels bad. I got to be the guy to break it to you. I, I got to tell you. I got to be. Gotta, gotta keep it real with you. You will have tribulation. Don't be shocked. I know they said you could just speak it into existence. You never will. Uh, that's not what Jesus taught. Oh yeah, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. What could the world do to me? I've already overcome them. And the spirit in me is greater than the spirit in the world. This is what Jesus is saying. He's already overcome the world. This would be a good time to pray. Lord, I don't want you to cut me off. We started hot. We started strong on the Lord saying, you're either going to get cut off or the branches are going to be pruned. Some of you have been acting wrong. Some of you have been this, this and that. You have no fruit in your life. No fruit of patience. No fruit of kindness. No fruit of joy. And he says the branches that don't produce get cut off and thrown in the fire. Now, what if I've been producing... And God says, I'm going to prune you. Some of you are being pruned right now. I believe tonight the prayer is this. This is absolutely the most important part of the whole stream. Okay, we're two, an hour and a half in. Lord, prune me tonight, Lord. I'm asking you. And friend, right now there's 3,000 of you on here. I'm asking the Lord to prune me. I'm asking the Lord to prune me. Maybe God's going to prune people out of your life that are toxic, that are poisonous, that are leading you down the wrong path. Wrong path. Maybe God's going to prune hobbies that are taking too much time. Maybe God's going to prune that 
addiction that you have. Maybe God's going to prune that girlfriend that you know. Come on, guys. God already told you she's not the one. Well, I've been with her. We have history. It doesn't matter. Your history with her is going to ruin the history that you can make with God. Get, get rid of it. God literally told me, break up with your girlfriend. I, I didn't have a choice. I, God pruned her. I had it. I, I four year relationship. I, I broke up with her through a text message because I knew if I called her, I would go right back to her. That's like number one thing. You don't break out with a girl through a text message, but God said, I'm pruning, I'm cutting, I'm chopping this thing off. Four years you've been with her. It's not your wife, Isaiah. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for you to prosper. So I cut her, I had to cut her off. I had some friends, my best friend growing up. Lord, save him, Lord. God's like, it's not going to work. You got to cut him off. Prune my job, prune my friends, prune my career, cut things off. Now don't ask God to cut things off that are not God's will to cut off. Just ask him to prune you. It's painful, it hurts, but it's better than being cut off, friend. It's better than being cut off. I would rather be pruned than God cut me off and throw me in the fire. Because there are people that are connected to the vine, but God's, God's going to throw you in the fire on judgment day. Lord, touch this chat tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Come on, just begin to pray. Oh, it hurts. I really like that hobby. I really like this addiction. I, I, some of you are getting TikTok cut off right now. Some of you are getting Instagram pruned off right now. Some of you are addicted to YouTube. It's time to cut it off. The Bible says, remove the thing that's causing you to sin. If your hand caused you to sin, cut it off. If your eye caused you to sin, gouge it out. These are the words of Jesus. Lord, prune me tonight. I pray, Lord, I'm the first one to respond to my altar call, by the way. Lord, I pray you would prune me, God. Prune any sin in my life out if there's arrogance if there's pride in my heart if there's bitterness resentment divisiveness lord whatever is in my life and this is my own prayer you guys can start praying for yourself right now because i'm starting with me i ain't gonna pray for you guys till i get my prayer i'm i'm gonna be the first one to say i need god to prune me lord prune it out prune out any pride prune out any arrogance prune out prune out prune out any ego prune out any anything lord in my heart i can think of laziness lukewarmness Cut it off of me, Lord. I don't want it. I give you permission, Holy Ghost, to prune me. I want to be producing fruit. I know I've produced, I know I produce fruit. So why do you need to get pruned? Because I want to produce more fruit. Lord, don't cut me off. Lord, don't cut me off. I want to know you. I want to abide in you. Help me to be a man of prayer. Come on, pray, chat. Help me to be a man of the word. Help me to be the priest of my home. Help me to serve you properly, God. Help me to fast. Just pray that right now. Help me, Lord. Don't cut me off, God. Give me another year, like the parable, and I believe it's Luke 13. The unfruitful fig tree. Lord, give me another year. Just give me one more year. More time to grow. Don't cut me off. Don't cut my family off, God. Lord, help me. Help me with your anointing and your spirit, God. Touch me right now, Lord. Touch the chat. I pray for every single person listening, you'd prune them tonight. If there's any pride in our hearts, God, prune it off. If there's any arrogance or compromise, Lord, right now, I pray you would prune it off in Jesus' name. Satan, you are a liar. Leave these people now. You have no power. You have no strength. The Lord rebukes you, Satan. You must go in Jesus' name. The blood is against you. We pray, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Prune us tonight. Shape us tonight. Addictions. Go in Jesus' name. Get off of us. Leave us alone. We don't want you. Every foul spirit must go in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you would prune off any friends in my life that are not of you. Now listen, let me just make something clear. God might cut people away that aren't bad people. God might cut... I need to say this. God might cut people away that are not bad people. They're just not right for you. They're just not the people that God wants in your life for your destiny. So it doesn't mean they're bad... It just means they're not right for you. They're not the right people for your destiny. Let God prune those people too. It hurts. I like them, Lord, but they got to go. You don't think I liked the girl I was with when I got saved? You don't think I liked the friends I had my whole life? Sorry, chief. You got to go. Prune me, Lord. Just prune me tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. And maybe it's good for them to be pruned. Maybe they're relying on you so much. They have a different assignment. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would prune us, you would anoint us, God, 
I pray you'd cut off everything that is not of you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and power, God. Anoint us today in Jesus' name. Fire of the Holy Spirit. Touch us right now, God. Fill us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Thank you, Lord. Again, make sure it's God. Don't just start cutting everyone out of your life because you feel like you're zealous. Make sure it's God telling you to do that. Make sure it's God showing you. He'll show you. He'll show you who they are, what they are, their true intentions and all that. Ask him. Don't let them shipwreck your destiny. Lord, prune us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and fire. Fill us with the power of God. Don't cut us off, Lord. We pray tonight in Jesus' name. Wash us with your precious blood. We repent, God, for compromise, for sin, for resentment, for bitterness, for complacency. We repent, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And guys, again, if it's not God, don't start breaking up with everybody, leaving this and all that. Make sure it's God, okay? I'm just telling you, God wants to prune some of you, but don't don't, don't take what I'm saying and, and not use wisdom. Make sure it's God telling you to do what you're doing because it was definitely God telling me to do it. Thank you, Lord. Don't cut us off. Bless us tonight in Jesus' name. If you guys want to sow into this broadcast, my throat is just, ugh. Lord, touch my throat. I had my AC on and my throat is dry and like you know when the ac's on your throat gets it's hurting when you talk that's my throat right now pray about sewing in excuse me one second gotta clear my throat pray about sewing into the broadcast um we had an awesome vacation last week took the kids out went to the beach stayed on the beach had a great time with them saw some of you out there so shout out to the you that came up to me that watched the channel i love and appreciate you guys uh, was able to film on Friday with Ruslan. Had a great time doing that. Go watch his episode. Tomorrow I'll be filming with Z in my studio. We have a lot of content. I have like three or four brand new guests lined up for you guys. I can't wait for you guys to hear them and see them. We have a lot of awesome content planned coming for you guys. Pray about partnering. Pray about giving monthly. If you are blessed by this, we're going to stay live on here. We're going to stay talking to the chat, answering questions, and just hanging out. So feel free to stay. But if you want to give, this will be the time to do it now. If tonight blessed you so into this word... That's what I'm going to say about it. Sow into it. If it's good ground to sow into, it's biblical to sow into what God is doing. So if you are blessed, you can give on PayPal linked in the comments. Thank you, Sarah Sanchez, who's already given tonight. I'll read the ones that come in through PayPal on the link. You can also give by scanning the QR code. You can give monthly. You can give one time. We really do need monthly partners. So thank you. Um, okay. Yes. Richard Lorenzo is one of the guests. He'll be on soon. I can't tell you when, but he'll be on soon. If you keep asking what my arm says, it says revival. Can you guys see that? It says revival a bunch of times. This is my old merch that I used to make. And uh, yeah, I had a little sleeve there. And then it has revival lifestyle and, and, and black and all that. Okay. So give there. Zell, Isaiah Luke Salivar, Yahoo.com, Venmo at Isaiah Saldivar, PayPal.me slash Isaiah Saldivar. You can click the links in the comments and description. I'm also going to read chat and hang out. I'm not getting off yet. So let me read some chat. Yes, we have uh, Richard Lorenzo Jr. coming on. Yes. He'll be coming on soon, and I have some other guests. I have an in-studio guest this week, in-studio guest next week, and then I have an in-studio guest coming soon that I'm very excited to announce. Oh, it's going to be good. I'm, I'm excited, guys. One of the things I'm doing this year is I'm branching. Well, I've always branched out and brought on a bunch of guests, okay? But I'm bringing on a bunch of new guests, new people. And again, this all goes back to the rebuke I gave in my um, video I just made on YouTube. I'm sure you've all seen it. At the end where I said, hey, if, the, if you guys are going to be toxic and vile in the chat, I will not be bringing on guests. So if you guys don't act right, if you guys come and spam in the chat toxic things while I have guests on, how can I bring on people that don't 100% believe in everything I believe in if you guys are going to treat them wrong when they're on? Especially my, my studio, I have screens and they can read the comments the whole time. So I promise you guys, this is, someone said in the chat on Friday, dad's going to get mad when he, when he sees these comments and I was mad, okay? And I promise you guys, y'all don't act right and you guys act like you're little kids because when I see a comment like some of the ones I was seeing Friday, I just assume you're a little kid. I, I, I just do. I just assume there's no way an adult talks like that and acts that way. That's way childish. So if you guys act like little kids and do that, I just won't bring on guests. It is what it is. I'll just preach and teach and do this and, and it, it'll be it'll be what it is. So act right so we can keep bringing on guests and I don't have to, you know, apologize to them and be embarrassed of my community when they're on. Anonymous. It's only happened once or twice, but one is one time is too many times. 
Anonymous said, haven't caught a live in a while. Powerful, challenging, convicting word tonight. Love you, bro. Thank you so much, Anonymous. Melanie Edwards said, great word tonight. Thank you, Melanie. Again, if you are blessed by this word, don't dine and dash. So into it through the website, through the Venmo, through the Zelle, through the PayPal. It keeps us going. We can't do this without you guys. Thank you, Melanie. Luis Elrizano said, thanks for the teaching, the word friend. Thank you, Luis. Anonymous, thank you. I didn't anticipate that was going to take me an hour to get through chapter, the first chapter. All right. <laughs> Someone's saying, don't mess this up for all of us. Y'all better not act ghetto. Uh, we tell our kindergartners to act right and they know what's up. Exactly. When I see, yeah, I was, yeah, all, all of you should have been embarrassed. Someone said, I was embarrassed. All of you should have been embarrassed how you, a lot of you guys were acting. Now, mind you, a lot of people acting that way were not from our community. So I'll be clear on that. But there was some people from our community that I know in the chat that were acting up. I'm just, I'm just telling you guys. And then also going forward, mods, uh, I give you guys the full, the, I give you guys the full authority to ban and mute people as you see fit and time them out. I know when I bring on people, I'm like, hey, leave them, let them go, let the, no, 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 you guys ruin that. Mods, if you start seeing people acting up and causing division and stirring up, I don't care who they are, or what they are, put them on timeout. When they get off timeout, if they do it again, permanently mute them and ban them. I have no problem with that. Goodbye. Okay, you're going into the abyss uh, of not being able to talk in my chat. Because I won't tolerate it. I'm not going to have my guests on. I don't mind. if you, It's one thing to do it to me, but I'm not going to have guests on and then have you guys acting like non-Christians. Lucas, thank you so much. There was a big YouTuber that made a video today about the whole situation. He said, I, for a minute, didn't even realize I was in a Christian um, broadcast, which is, I agree with him. I agree with him. So yeah, you'll get invited to the block party because we're not doing that. Guys, we're not, we're not, listen, again, I only expect young, young kids to do that. So don't, don't do that. Please, I don't want to have to keep going on about it and stuff like that. I'm just letting you know the mods. Um, yeah. Oh, good. Hold on. Let me get you, Marcella. Yeah, we need, we need, if you know me in person, if I know you personally, you're from Lifesong or from my church and you want to help moderate, let me know. Because I do need more mods as well. There you go, Marcella. I made you, uh, let's see. Remove chats, hide timeout. Okay, you're a managing moderator, so you can ban mute all that. So yeah, if you are if you want to help mod, I know you in person. I could trust you. you. I've seen you in the chat a lot. I can mod you, okay? But yeah, we do need more mods. You guys did good, but it was out of control. It was out of control. So I know some of you are like, I don't want to ban certain people. Just ban whoever. Ban whoever. I don't care who they are. Time them out. Ban them. Do what you have to do. Because I'm not I'm not tolerating that ever, ever again. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, that's not hap that's not happening again. I'll just turn the chat off. Or I'll just go to pre-recorded podcasts. Which to me, I don't like. I love live. I love live. I love watching live content. Most of the content I watch, I wouldn't even watch if it wasn't live. I want to do live podcasts. Live podcasts are way harder for me. I have to do it on a certain day, a certain time. It's 10 times easier to pre-record and just play. I can pretty much have all the guests you guys ask on that don't have time in their schedule on any time if I pre-recorded, but I don't like pre-recorded. I like live. I like being right there with the chat talking. So I don't want to do pre-recorded podcasts. But again, if people act the way they act that way, I have to do it. I don't have a choice because I won't tolerate that. I won't tolerate people getting abused. When Come on my show and get abused by my community. What are you? What is that? Warren and Donna said, thank you. Very good teaching. Thank you for being such a good model and teacher. Thank you, Warren and Donna. Janae said, thank you so much for tonight, Isaiah. Please help me pray for my children. Thank you so much, Janae. All the donations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Are tattoos bad? My personal stance on tattoos, I already have a video on this, is I do not believe generally tattoos are a sin because I don't have a scripture that, besides Leviticus, which was a different context. So I personally do not have any tattoos. And I believe for me personally, it's a sin if I get a tattoo. So I believe God has already told me don't get tattoos. So for me, it would be a sin if I got a tattoo, but you have to go by your own conviction. So that's my, I have a video on tattoos, but that's my stance on that. So generally I don't preach that tattoos are a sin to get, but for me, they are a sin. Paul says for one person, it could be a sin for other person. It might. Yeah, Z's my cousin. He'll be on tomorrow. Pedro, thank you so much. Pedro, uh, Henrique Mafra. Thank you so much. For help that you give me going back to God. I'm still going through trouble getting rid of demons. For God's been calling me now. I'm getting ready to pick up the armor. Amen. Pedro, go on my website and get deliverance on the deliverance map. Get deliverance on the deliverance map. Okay. Now, for some of you that are like, whoa, why aren't we allowed to? I don't mind disagreements. But remember, at the end of the day, this is my chat, my broadcast. And I can moderate it however I want. And I don't think being toxic and divisive is the right way to approach things. So I don't allow it in my broadcast. And if you don't like that, then go to a broadcast where the name doesn't say Isaiah Saldivar. I, that's all I can tell you. I, I don't know how, I'm trying to be nice about it. If you act, 
envious, divisive, and cause strife. The Bible says don't do that. The Bible literally says don't do that. So if you do what the Bible says don't do, I'm not going to allow it in my chat. It's, it's sin. It's literally sin. So, yes, I have deliverance map on the website. Are you going to be streaming a prayer meeting this Friday? I want to. I want to. The prayer streams have been amazing. I want to stream prayer on Friday. Maybe, yeah, maybe we will at the studio. Maybe I'll have the wife on for the prayer stream. Who knows? We'll see. But I want to. I want to. Someone says, I love eating shrimp. It's not a sin. I don't believe eating shrimp is a sin. No. Uh, the Bible makes it clear in the book of Acts that there's no unclean food like that anymore. Can you bring Uncle Nino on? I'm working on it. What if they're unbelievers? You can tell when someone's in the chat and they're an unbeliever or not. And if they're an unbeliever spamming things they shouldn't be spamming, then yes, mute them. The bottom line is, doesn't matter if you're a believer or unbeliever, I won't tolerate it. Doesn't matter. Um, it, do it doesn't matter. Sadly, it was a lot of believers doing it. Pump the music, fam. Is this, uh, is the music too low? Can you hear the music or no? Make sure if you haven't liked the broadcast, you like the broadcast. I, I know you guys always ask for the voice changer. I haven't done it in a long time. Um... Maybe we'll do it soon and have some fun. But let me just read the chat for a bit and hang out with you guys. I miss you guys. I oh, you know what? That's why I miss you guys so much. I wasn't live last week. I just realized that. I was like, it's been so long. Wait, I wasn't live last week, right? No, Monday was the movie. Tuesday was... Tuesday I left. Can't hear it? Uh... I like the dark background in today's video. Yeah, a lot of people like the dark background. Um, but yeah, just dark background. I like I like the colors in this studio. So who knows? We're 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 gonna redo the studio soon, the home studio. But I have that brand new studio I use, and you know we'll see. For some videos, I'll use the dark background, but that's more for my serious talks. If the lights are off, it's it's serious talk. Put it that way. Anonymous, thank you for the donation. Now the movie. I don't know if it's coming out again. I heard it might be coming out a third time in theaters, but I'm praying they release it on streaming platforms. I think it's time we get it on the streaming platform so everyone could watch it. But I don't know. I heard it might be a third release in theaters. I'm not sure yet. So I'll have to get more info on that. But I would like it to get released on streaming platforms now. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm working on it, guys. I'm trying. I don't, I'm not in charge of it, so... It is what it is that with that. It was it was it's a really good movie. Have you seen the movie Nefarious? I haven't. Um, one of the guys that's running the movie production and all that sent me a link to watch it. So I'm, I've been meaning to watch it. I heard it's really good. I heard it's only rated R because uh, uh, they slapped a rated R thing on it because they wanted to like limit them at the box office. But I heard it's like a really really good movie. It's obviously a Christian movie. So yeah, I heard Nefarious is awesome and I plan to see it. I, obviously it's not for kids, but yeah, it's like the screw tape letters kind of right. But uh, I do have a link to watch it, so maybe I'll do that soon. I should probably do that soon. I've just been really busy, guys. I had a vacation, and then, uh, yeah, I was busy. We, we went to Southern California, which is like eight hours from me. So that's that. Do you like pizza? Yes. So I was gone from Tuesday to Sunday we got home. Yeah, Vlad said he really liked it. Uh, Pagani, I think, said he really liked it. Greg said he really liked it, so. Now to sum it up, be like-minded, sympathetic, brotherly, tenderhearted, and humble in spirit. First Peter 3, 8. Yes. Amen, 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 amen. Just want to haul at Marcella. I heard your Delphi testimony. You run the map. Of course, praising God for the body. Yes, Kathleen, Marcella is awesome. Her episode went crazy awesome, good, and it's reaching tons of people, and people are getting delivered, saved through it. And so if you need any pictures, hit up Marcella, because she also takes professional photography, and she does amazing she did our family photos. If you didn't see them, they're on my Instagram. But yeah, hit up Marcella if you need pictures. And uh, her testimony is awesome. She's an amazing worship leader. God's just done such a great work in her life. I've known her for years. She's been consistent. And I have nothing but good things to say about her. And she runs our deliverance map. So the list goes on. She's awesome. We'll have her on again for sure in the future. Tyler Adams said, repent from pizza. Why, dude? I love pizza. I love pizza, dude. Is it a sin to eat three times a day? No. Can you guys hear the music? Let me see music loop there's definitely music playing should i put it a little louder you guys have to hear that right do you hear that hold on marcel about to get even busier yes she's awesome Alyssa's doing good oh yeah it's on it's on 
We can hear. Okay, okay, okay. Alyssa's doing good. She was also disappointed about Friday heavily. I talked about in the video, so don't disappoint my wife. Thank you. Doesn't need to be louder. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I, I don't hear music. Oh, there's music on. Don't make it lower. Um, lots of comments. I'm trying to read them all. Thank you for posting the giving links. Again, if you want to help moderate and you're either a part of Life Song, I know you in person, or you're a regular here, I'll mod you. Um, yeah. Evangelist Jonna, do you want me to mod you? Because I see you all the time and I feel like you're very trustworthy. I've seen you in the partner calls. I see you in the, all the comments. Uh, let me know if you want me to mod you, Evangelist Jonna. You pretty much know how we flow, so uh, I'm pretty sure you'd be good at, at moderating. Okay, cool. I'll mod you right now. Praise the Lord. Let's see. Add uh, as a moderator. Manage, bunker, change chat modes in live. Also, let's go to standard moderators. Okay, managing moderator. Boom, new mods. It's like we're hiring new police officers right now, and some of y'all criminals are hiding in the chat. You're about to get busted. Awesome. Okay. Anybody else that's a regular that I know? If you want to be a moderator, just be a regular in the chat and be trustworthy. And don't be typing anything crazy because I do I do read the chat all the time. Let's see. Anybody else? Maybe your pastor's wife or you're a pastor or something. You're trustworthy. You're not going to go rogue and start banning and muting everybody. Oh, Diane Stevens, you're not a mod? How are you not a mod, Diane? Yes, you're now a moderator. Let's see, add as moderator. Okay, you can, okay, so you can remove chat messages, you can hide people, you can ban people. Okay, there you go. How are you not a moderator, Diane Stevens? You've been here for so long. Awesome. Okay, so now type real quick, Diane, you should be a moderator now. Love your support for law enforcement. Yes, I love law enforcement. My mom's an officer. I was going to be an officer. Uh, my stepdad's a lieutenant and all that. I love I love uh, law enforcement officers. You guys are legendary. Okay, cool. You're a mod in Discord? Oh, that's probably why. Okay. One thing I don't like about my restream is sometimes the names. Um, it's hard to see because there's no pictures. So when I'm on YouTube, I can see the pictures. There's no mods on TikTok, no. Okay, good. Okay, so we got Rallis, Evangelist Jonna, Diane Stevens, Marcella, Candy. Where are my men at, y'all? Listen, women, you guys are awesome, but I need some men moderators as well. I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter, but we need some guys to step up. Step it up, boys. Get off the Call of Duty, boys. Help me moderate. Help me moderate. Get off the Call of Duty. Get off the Fortnite, whatever it is you guys play. Uh, I don't write if you 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 got to let me know if I'm gonna mod you if you're if I know you in person if you're from my church if you've been here for a long time I can't just mod you randomly because you say mod me so it, it's hard to know because there's a lot of comments coming in uh, okay I think right now I'll just kind of wait and see people that have been here a long time or people that I know personally someone said I can't be trusted laugh out loud listen some of y'all all right Emily Maxwell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mod you, okay? But I'm sure I've seen your, I'm pretty sure I've seen your name and stuff like that. I'm gonna mod you, but just make sure that you, you know, if you have any questions, ask the other mods and they'll help you. So there you go. With great power comes great responsibility. And guys, don't just ban people if you don't like them. Just again, make sure it's, and guys, my chat's coming in fast. I'm trying to read all of them. I'm trying to read all of them. If I miss your comments, sorry. I'm, it's nothing personal. There's 1,800 people commenting in here right now. Yes, you've been given the ban hammer. The blue wench is amazing. Yeah, you get that blue that blue wrench to smack people over the head and ban them. Send them to the abyss. Man, the chat is fast. Yes, I'm trying to read it. I'm trying to read it as much as I can. My name is Robert. Hello, Robert. Yeah, mod people you know in person. Yeah, I'm trying to mod people that I know because if someone goes rogue, it's all bad. It's all bad if someone goes rogue. Josh Wright, appreciate you, bro. 
Yeah, the blue wrench is moderators. Honestly, our mods are amazing. They they put the links up. They they ban people. I, I that's how we run it. You, listen, some chats there's no mods. That's that's fine. But I don't want to be a place where it's a toxic chat. And if you don't have rules, you don't have laws in place, then things get out of control. So it's important we have moderators and there's law here. Because if not, it gets out of hand. A mod is a moderator. They're able to ban people, time out people, of, uh, approve messages, deny messages, all that kind of stuff. That's what a moderator is. Can you slow the chat down? I will maybe for the next stream. I forgot to do it this time, but right now it's okay. My appeal box is down in the description. Man, my throat is so dry from that AC. I think we're good right now for mods. I think we're good right now. Thank you guys. Uh, Hazel, how do we know if we're God is permanently cutting us off from toxic family or just removing them for a season? A God will, God will show you. You just gotta trust the Holy Spirit. He'll make it, he'll make it away. Mark Wampler, I love you, bro, and appreciate you. You're awesome, man. When you chop in your tongue, <laughs> imagine brand new people. Uh, my kids actually have procedures getting done this week actually on Wednesday, so be praying for them. My daughter has two lip ties, or she has a tongue tie and two lip ties she's getting cut, and then my other two daughters are getting work done. So I'm gonna get them all done and healed up and everything first, and then I'm gonna be talking to the therapist for a few months, and then I'm getting my my tongue cut, or the bottom thing in my tongue cut. If you're new and you're like, what is he talking about? I already explained it. I don't wanna go over it again. Yeah, that's, I don't wanna go over it again. I'm getting, I'm getting pruned. Basically, the dentist is going to prune my, prune me. Put it that way. Yeah, Tiff, the dentist said it's not a bad procedure at all. It's just the, she wants me to go through like four months of therapy because if not, she said like, I won't be able to talk right or something. I don't know. I have, she, she's making me go through like four months of like therapy first. Someone said, please don't stick your tongue out. I'm not, don't worry. All right, what's wrong with your tongue? I have uh, like severely restricted tongue. It's where you have a thing under your tongue that holds your tongue from being able to fully like move around and extend. And I didn't know anything about it for 31 years. I went to my kid's dentist and they were like, oh, your daughter has this tongue thing. She needs to get taken care of because there's tons of symptoms and things that happen when you have it. And I was like, oh, I have that too. And 31 years later, I didn't even know. And basically every symptom of having this, I have. And so I got to get it done. So that's that. My youngest daughter was born tongue-tied. They went to the procedure until she was 16. I didn't even know what tongue-tied was until like a month ago. Never heard about it in my life until, until my daughter had it and I have it really bad. I just thought I had a small tongue, but she's like, no, you're just tongue-tied. You learn something new every day. How do you think I felt for 31 years? I've had braces, Invisalign. I've been a dentist, orthodontist. No one ever told me anything. I've been a doctor. No one ever told me anything. So the symptoms are like loss of appetite, no appetite, being a picky eater because your palate and taste buds don't fully work when your tongue's not able to be fully move, moved around. Um, neck pain, back problems, back pain, and basically everything that, basically the whole list of stuff that I struggle with and the doctors can never figure it out what it is. Basically because your tongue can't fully extend, your body and neck and muscles all compensate for the fact your tongue's not properly working. Also like slurred speech, mumbling, which is what I do all the time, not pronunciating words, which I literally have to like intentionally force myself to pronunciate words because I don't pronunciate words properly unless I think about it to do it. So a bunch of things, I just need to get it done. There's a bunch of reasons why, but yeah. So basically she said, I have to go through therapy because for 31 years, my tongue has been working a certain way. Once they cut it, if I don't have the therapy, then your tongue just doesn't work right. And who knows? I just told her, look, I don't want to come out of it looking like a, a, a 40 year old chihuahua with my tongue sticking out of my mouth. Okay. I'm hoping that I come out of it. I don't have a lisp. No, but that's one of the symptoms. I hope I don't come out. I mean, I hope I come out of it with an Australian accent. So that'd be cool. People say it's common, but I've never heard of it in my life. And I've been to like five or six different dentists and orthodontists in my life. But I think it's like a 5% of people have it, something like that. Apparently it's common. People just don't know about it. I don't know. 
No one in my area does it, but there's one dentist, which is so weird. Bro, you're so funny. Thank you. Uh, do you need to be baptized to be saved? I do not believe you do, and I'm going to tell you the reason why. I believe we should all get water baptized as a commandment. Do I believe you have to get water baptized to be saved? No. I do not believe if you get saved at church, drive home and die in a car accident because you didn't get water baptized, you die and go to hell. I don't believe that. And I know it's, I know that to be the case because Acts chapter 10, Peter's preaching to Cornelius' household. The Bible says as he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and his house. That was the sign that God was accepting the Gentiles now into his family and they were not water baptized. After they received the Holy Spirit, they got water baptized. So if you're telling me you have to be water baptized to be saved, then you're telling me they had the Holy Spirit, but they weren't saved. So Acts 10 completely eliminates the idea that you have to be water baptized to be saved. So there's that. My daughter also has two lip ties, so they're going to take care of those too because uh, the lip ties are causing her gums to get pulled down and all that stuff. So yeah, she's getting a lot done that day, and so I'll be praying for my kids on Wednesday. It's going to be a long day. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized, correct? Have you been in Mississippi? No, I'm sure I have. I've been to almost, almost every state. Yes, get baptized for sure. We Listen, we baptize every service every Sunday. If you want to get baptized any service, any Sunday, we baptize. Literally, there's not a Sunday that goes by where we're not water baptizing people. So the last time I preached at my church, we baptized 20 people while I was preaching. So yes, get water baptized for sure. But it's not salvific. Put it that way. Okay, thank you guys. All right, we're about to hit two hours. Tomorrow's going to be fun. Where's Carl? I got you. I got you. He's right here. Tomorrow's going to be fun with Z. Very powerful testimony. Strong anointing on his life. My cousin, he'll, you know, we're going to make him rap and everything and, and freestyle. Who knows? What if I, what if tomorrow's the first time I rap on stream? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? We'll see. We'll see. Tomorrow could be my big day, my debut. I'll come out with my debut with a Z. Uh, no, that's not a pigeon. That's a dove. He's been born again. That's our friend. So yes, tomorrow we'll make Z rap. We'll have him share his testimony. We'll preach and all that. And then we'll hang out with the chat. We'll talk and do all that fun stuff. Okay? Excuse me. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Stay tuned for the song because it's fire. I'm going to tell you before I play it, the song is called Come Out in Jesus' Name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. Come out in Jesus' name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. By Jeffrey Jocelyn. Here we go. Oh, hey. Didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Love you guys. Super easy, super free. See you tomorrow. Helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you're doing. Hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. Let the truth be I'm calling every Christian. This song Ain't is no fire, away. dude. Flames, come on now. What do you guys think? And that's never gonna change. Let every tongue crank it up, crank it up. And Jesus is the king. And one accord, we're moving forward. Break every chain. Demons start to tremble. You guys know I'm a drummer, right? I need to get an electric drum set for the studio. Every unclean spirit must come out in Jesus' name. You can read it in the Bible, it's written there in the song red. is amazing. You will never be deceived if you believe what Jesus said. We're running out of time. Tell everyone you can Turn the darkness and the light So let the fire begin Demons start to tremble Devils go insane They feel the flames get hotter As they try to run away They can try to hide But they're out of time When they hear the saints proclaim Every unclean spirit Must come out in Jesus' name
know we're weird. Get over it. I'm 31 years old. My cool stage is long gone. Tonight was amazing. Thank you guys for the love and support. I love and appreciate every single one of you. This community is amazing. We're going to do better in Jesus' name. We'll be live tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Don't miss it. What a song. Where's the Dove Awards at? Y'all are giving out these awards to these lukewarm worship teams. Come on now. Give Jeffrey Jocelyn a real award out here. This is real music. Every young clean spirit must come out in Jesus' name. Good night, guys. Love y'all.